Calaroga Shark Media. Hello, I'm Johnny Mack with your daily comedy news. David Lucas was on the Joe Rogan Experience. He started making fun of Rogan, calling him a strong-ass Howie Mandel, who looked like a school teacher when you see them out in public. The Hollywood Reporter talked to some famous podcasters, including Theo Vaughn, with some Q&A. Let's go quick here. Theo, current favorite podcast you're not involved in? Answer, the Joe Rogan Experience and Matt and Shane's Secret Podcast. Question, how would you like to see podcasting evolve? Answer, I don't know. Question, biggest challenge facing podcasting now? Answer, everyone has a podcast, even animals. Thoughts on listening at 1.5 speed? Love it. I listen at 2.3, but I'm crazy. Question, we need podcasts because, answer, mainstream media doesn't allow certain humor and voices. F them, we made our own. Question, weirdest ad you ever had to record? Answer, Lenny's urine tablets. Change the color of your pee, one milligram and five milligrams. Jimmy Kimmel was on a podcast, apparently it's one with Gavin Newsom, Marshawn Lynch, and Doug Hendrickson. It's called Politicken. That's a weird combination of hosts. Anyway, Jimmy Kimmel said, I don't know if there'll be any late night television shows on network TV in 10 years. Maybe there'll be one out there, but there won't be a lot of them. There's a lot to watch, and now people can watch anything at any time. They've got all these streaming services. It used to be Johnny Carson was the only thing on at 11.30, so everybody watched. And then David Letterman was on after Johnny, so people watched those two shows. But now there's so many options. Maybe more significantly, the fact that people are easily able to watch your monologues online the next day. It really cancels out the need to watch it when it's on the air. Once people stop watching it when it's on the air, networks are going to stop paying for it to be made. Johnny Mack, you never mentioned Matt Reif. I know, right? The LA Times said Matt Reif is living his comedy dream, and now for the hard part, maintaining it. Matt Reif scheduled clocking 40 to 50 shows a month, writes the LA Times. Led to a stretch of consecutive days without sleep as he stayed up prepping for shows, editing social videos, and barreling from city to city. He fought through it before a pair of recent shows in Indiana. He said he almost collapsed while leaving his hotel room and was forced to cancel the gigs hours before showtime. Suffering blurred vision and painful ringing in his ears, he could barely walk or talk. He had to be taken to the ER. Reif said during an interview with the Kookaburra Lounge in Hollywood, I felt like I was legitimately dying. It's embarrassing, man, because everybody around me saw this coming. Everybody's response was, can't believe this didn't happen sooner. He talked about crowd work. And said, when you're rehearsing your set, building material on a show for an hour-long material special, you can definitely get tired of telling your own jokes. When I started doing comedy, this was never a dream of mine to be at this level. I was just like, if I could ever sell out a comedy club one time ever, that's the epitome of what I think a comedian probably could be. Fellow comedian Eric Griffin, who directed Lucid, said, what I admire about Matt Reif is his work ethic. Nothing was added to him. He's been working hard for 12 years now. The fan base has kind of caught up with it, and they've made him super famous. Rife became obsessed with comedy at age 15 when Grandma took him to see Dean Cook. The first time he went on stage for an open mic, he said he almost soiled his pants. Thank you, Matt, for that image. Matt said, I had all my jokes memorized, but I was so nervous, and the host goes on stage. We have a first-timer tonight. Give it up for the uncomfortably young Matt Reef. Griffin says he draws people in because he listens. So when he's doing this crowd work with people, he's genuinely interested in what people are saying. Those are the type of clips that have gone viral for him. And those are the things that resonate with people. It's not just crowd work for the sake of crowd work. As I mentioned earlier in the week, I really like the special. I thought it was a lot of fun. It's not trying to be high art. It's just an hour of jokes. And I laughed. Uh, had a good time on the couch. You should watch it. It's fun. Rife warns audience members, don't try to be funny. Don't do that. Just be yourself. I'll bring the comedy out of you. Don't worry. We'll find it. We're going to Jordan and Pip in this. Don't be selfish. The Guardian spoke to one of my favorite comedians, Phil Wang. He's got a new mustache and says, it's an experiment. My girlfriend asked if I could grow one because she's into the look. She's the wind beneath my wings, mustache-wise. Now I've written some stand-up about having one, so it's locked in for the time being. I'm laughing. Uh, last week, I was like, yeah, maybe I'll try and grow a cheesy mustache, or at least I won't shave until my wife notices and complains about it. And then every day... I would, like, forget about this concept and shave it. So I didn't grow a cheesy mustache. Maybe over Labor Day weekend. We'll see. The Guardian said, Eurasian people have said your success means a lot to them. Is that a source of pride, Phil Wang? Phil said, definitely. They messaged me about my book, Side Splitter, How to Be from Two Worlds at Once. Some say I was the first East Asian comedian they saw on TV. Thankfully, that's not the case anymore. There's been a real explosion in the past five years, which is very encouraging. Tastes have broadened, and the comedy industry tends to follow tastes. A lot of the work for us was done by K-pop Squid Game, Parasite, and everything everywhere all at once. The more people see Asians in other entertainment forms, the less weird it becomes to see them do stand-up. These things build on each other. I call it cool bleed. It also follows food culture. Interestingly, Thai, Vietnamese, Korean, and Malaysian food have all gotten big in the UK, which provides more reference points. East Asian comedians can talk about kimchi, and Western audiences will understand. These things all track together and give us a leg up. 
Phil Wang's special is called Wang In There, Baby. It'll be on Netflix September 3rd. Jimmy Fallon announced he's staging a haunted maze at 30 Rock. Why? I don't know either. Designed by the team behind Universal Studios, parent company of NBC. That explains it. Theme Park's Halloween Horror Nights, Jimmy Fallon's Tonightmares, will feature 10 rooms, in one of which Johnny Carson rolls over in his grave, each based on some of his deepest, darkest nightmares. Those fears include werewolves, aliens, brain-eating zombies, murderous AI robots, an abandoned gas station, and a cornfield crawling with homicidal scarecrows. In a statement, Jimmy Fallon said, Tonightmares has got everything you need to get supremely frightened this Halloween. Jimmy also has a new book. It's a children's book called Five More Sleeps Till Halloween. The book is due out September 3rd. It's a follow-up to Jimmy Fallon's very, very famous and very, very popular 2020 Christmas book, Five More Sleeps Till Christmas. Not to be confused with the Beastie Boys' Five More Sleeps Till Brooklyn. So where can I see Tonightmares? Right in Rockefeller Center. So that's where they do the Christmas tree. So I see what NBC is doing here. All right. So we'll do the Halloween thing and we'll run that for a month. And then we take that down. We put up the tree. Actually pretty smart. Tourists will eat that up. I used to work in that neighborhood. And yeah, I'll just repeat myself. Tourists will eat that up. Jimmy Fallon's Tonightmares will run select nights from September 20th through Halloween. Are you psyched for the Australian edition of The Office? It's the 13th global incarnation of The Office. This one will air globally on Prime Video, except in the United States. VPN much? Which is a shame because the Australian office is in English and we could watch it. We could enjoy it in the Australian version of The Office. Felicity Ward plays boss Hannah Howard, who manages the packing company Finley Craddock. In the Australian version of The Office, Howard gets news from the head office that they'll be shutting down her branch and forcing everyone to work remotely, a move that sees her go into survival mode, making promises she can't keep in order to keep her work family together. The staff of Finley Craddock indulge her and must endure Howard's outlandish plots as they work together the impossible targets that have been set for them. I wonder if there's a Jim and Pam thing. I wonder if there's a Tim and Don thing here. Let's see. The cast includes Eva Poor, Steen Raskopoulos. Sherry Sebbins, and a bunch of other Australian actors that I'm not familiar with. Dina Hashem spoke to Slate about the New York City roast scene from 10 years ago. Dina said, At a certain point, it was a feeder for the Comedy Central roast battle show on TV, so it was like a way to get into the stand comedy club, which is where it was being hosted for the most part. So it was like a way of showing my joke writing ability and hopefully a way of maybe getting my first TV appearance, which actually happened. So for me, it was a way of advancing my career more than like a love for the sport of roasting. Slate said, some comics love it. Dina said, yeah, it's a lot of work. You have to sit down and learn a bunch of stuff about somebody else. Like, if you're really crazy, you'll scout their podcast and try to find something they didn't even know that you're going to know about them. And it's so much work for jokes that you can never, ever use again. And you can't really test them out. Like, you can't take the jokes and go to a show and test them. So you're just going up having no idea how the crowd's going to react. And I'll leave you with this fun story from Yahoo. Back in November 2025, Marcelo Hernandez, you know him from Saturday Night Live, had just wrapped rehearsal with that week's host, Dave Chappelle. Marcelo says, I was like, uh, hey, Dave, do you know the entrance to Madison Square Garden? You see, Marcelo Hernandez was booked to open for Joe Coy. You remember Joe Coy? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Relax. Scott Beckett, friend of the show right now, is losing his mind. He thinks I'm going to play the Joe Coy clip. Should I play the Joe Coy clip? Make Scott Beckett upset. Remember that time Joe Coy hosted the Golden Globes? And he said this about Taylor Swift. Big difference between the Golden Globes and the NFL. On the Golden Globes, we have fewer camera shots of Taylor Swift. Sorry, I couldn't resist, bro. (laughs) All right, Marcelo Hernandez. He's there with uh, Dave Chappelle. And Marcelo's going to open for Joe Coy at MSG. And he goes, hey, Dave, do you know the entrance to Madison Square Garden? And Dave goes, you're going to take an Uber in Madison Square Garden? And Marcelo's like, yeah, what's wrong with that? And Dave says, there's 22 entrances at Madison Square Garden. You're never going to get in. Chappelle made a call. Soon, Marcelo Hernandez was on his way, and he learned about loading dock, baby. (laughs) Welcome to Showbiz, Marcelo, and that is your comedy news for today. Hey, if you like the program, tell a friend about it, too. If you like talking about comedy, join the Facebook group. It's Daily Comedy News Podcast Group. Meet you here tomorrow.